of the JLI Jewish retreat, which is certainly going to happen this summer. At least we have to uh, anticipate that. Looking forward to it, and it'll be very, very special. Like everything after this uh, whole crisis is over. So um, the topic that seems to be quite relevant under the circumstances is the eternity of the soul. What dies, what doesn't die, what remains, where does it remain, how does it remain? What is that whole idea of life after death? Actually, life after death is a little confusing, that expression. I mean, to say someone died, but is he still alive, sounds like an oxymoron. If he died, he's not alive. And if he's alive, then he didn't die. So that's where the question presented in that way becomes, becomes impossible to deal with. So let's rethink that. The Torah says that uh, after eating from the tree of knowledge, man was told, Adam was told, that from dust you are and to dust you will return. What is from dust? What comes from dust? You go back a little bit in the description of creation. It says God formed the body of a human being from the dust. It was inert. It was not alive. But then God breathed into it a living soul and the body came alive. In other words, the body lives off the energy of the soul. The soul is a living entity, a dynamis, and it gives life to the body when they're brought together. Actually, there are two souls. One is the natural soul, the human soul, which was created when God said, let us make man. The angels did not agree. So God went ahead and created man without the angels. The angels objected because they knew that man would have free choice and would be capable of sinning and even attracted to sin. Why would God create such a being? So the angels said, we, we, we can't relate to this. So God created the human being without the angels, and told the angels that they will eventually appreciate the greatness of a human being. So that is the natural soul, the soul that gives life to the body, the soul that gives us our human personality, our human understanding, um, our orientation to the rest of creation, because we are also created. So God created light by saying, let there be light. God created the human soul by saying, let there be man or you man. But then there's also the godly soul. Concerning the godly soul, it doesn't say that God created it through words. It says he breathed it into man, into Adam. That's a different soul. That comes not from words or the breath used for words. It comes from a deeper breath, a more essential breath, the breath you can't live without. That's the godly soul, a little piece of God. Now, one of the differences between them is that the human soul being created is mortal. It can stop existing because it once did not exist, like everything else in creation. The godly soul, on the other hand, always existed because it's a part of God. So there is no non-existence in its, in its makeup. 
it can't not exist. What is the practical difference? The practical difference is that the human soul is afraid of death, has a survival instinct, whereas the godly soul has no such fear and therefore no such obsession. The godly soul knows that it doesn't belong on earth. It is heavenly, actually greater than heavenly because heavens were also created out of nothing. So the godly soul wonders, what is it doing here? Does not really by nature appreciate being here. This is not its natural habitat. But once it finds its mission, once it is told that it is here on a mission to serve God's purpose, then of course it accepts that mission and does it gladly, enthusiastically. So for all practical purposes, the animal soul is what makes us think the human soul, and it's also called animal soul because it animates the body. Uh, it also has something similar to the animal in that it is drawn downward. It finds its pleasure in things beneath itself. Like a human being getting pleasure from food. Now food is a much lower level of creation. It's a vegetable, a mineral, even if it's an animal. It's all below the human being, and yet that's where we get our pleasure. So the human soul has a human understanding, which means very simply, it takes itself for granted, its own existence. I'm real. God, I don't know. I heard about it. I maybe even believe it. But my reality base is me. I am for sure, and I might choose to believe in God. But God is extra natural, something other than my nature. That's the human soul. The human soul taking itself very seriously, also by extension, takes its needs very seriously. If I need something, don't get in my way. Even if I want something, don't get in my way. And if I desire something, you sh definitely shouldn't get in my way. That is the nature of the human soul. And that's why human beings have a hard time getting along. My existence is threatened by your existence. My needs are threatened by your needs. <laughs> Ironically, it's because we both have the same needs. What should bring us together, theoret theoretically, uh, we, we have common needs. So we understand each other. Shouldn't that help us get along? Well, actually, <laughs> having common needs means there are a lot of things we're going to fight over. And that's why a marriage is best and most successful when the man has masculine needs and the woman has feminine needs. When they become too much alike and they start needing the same thing, there's trouble in paradise. So because we have the same needs, we become competitors. Your existence with your needs, with your appetites, with your passions, is a threat to my needs and my appetites and my passions. It takes moral fiber. It takes intelligence and maturity to work myself past that threat and actually like people. Instead of being threatened by them, I find how their existence enhances my existence. 
So I actually need them and love them, but because they serve a positive function in my existence, which means it's not pure altruism. That's the human soul. Now, when a person passes away, the human soul is judged. Did it accomplish? Did it serve the purpose for which it was created? Did it acquire morality, godliness, goodness, and holiness? If it did, then it continues to live. It does not die. To quote a famous poem, uh, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. From dust you are, and to dust returneth, was never spoken of the soul. Only the body dies, because the body comes from dust. At the end of life, it goes back to dust. But what does end of life mean? The end of borrowed life for the body. During life, meaning the body's life, it borrows life and energy from the soul. When body and soul go their separate ways, the body goes back to where it came from, which is natural and, and, and necessary. So from dust you are and to dust return is not only a curse, it's also the nature of the body so that it is an honor and a and a pleasure for the body when the, when the soul leaves to go back to the earth. And that's why in Jewish tradition, we try not to delay the burial, even for a short while, as long as it's possible, we do the burial as quickly. Because once the soul has, once the body has no soul, its place is in the earth, which is why we don't do cremations. So the body goes back to where it came from. What happens to the soul? And there are two souls. So certainly the godly soul goes back to where it came from. It's a part of God, a little piece of God. It goes back to God and is reabsorbed into God. What happens to the human soul? So here's what we accomplish in the course of our lifetime. If we do good, if we serve God, if we perform mitzvahs, if we live in, in the service of God, then the animal human soul has become a tool for godliness. Because without the animal soul animating the body, we can't do any mitzvah. You cannot give charity without a body. You can't eat matzah without a body. You can't light a Shabbos candle. You can't go to the mikvah without a body. So when the body serves that, that function, it acquires divinity, which is also eternity, immortality. So parts of the soul, the human soul, that cooperated with the godly soul in performing the mitzvahs, that part of the, of the human soul now joins the godly soul in heaven. The more we do mitzvahs, the greater part of the, of the human soul is elevated into holiness and godliness and, and attains immortality. Now that's a huge accomplishment. For the godly soul to remain and be eternal, that's its nature. For the body to die and go back to the earth, that's its nature. But for a human soul, a created being, which by nature is not eternal or immortal, acquires immortality and continues to live with the godly soul. So the question is not, is there life after death? The question is, when the body dies, where does life 
relocate to. Because life will go on. The soul will go on. And all life is in the soul. Which means the soul that leaves the body retains its, its, its personality, its energy, its memories, its experiences, its relationships. So in the soul, every relationship is permanent. So parents are, are aware of their children. Parents in heaven are aware of their children. They're still attached. Parental love and devotion doesn't end or die. Uh, the child's growth and success and morality is still crucially important to the God, to the godly soul of the parent and of the of the um, family member, husband and wife. It's all important because life doesn't die. Do you have to really be religious and make a leap of faith to believe that life doesn't die? <laughs> no, life doesn't die. Energy does not disappear. It doesn't stop existing. It can relocate, it can transform, it can take on another, another structure but it can't stop existing. So life does not die. How much does the soul retain? Well, hopefully all good memories, all good experiences remain. The negative experiences, the bad stuff, the, the unholy pleasures that the body engaged in, dragging the soul with it, that gets erased. And in fact, that is the purpose of death. When human beings became capable of sinning, they also needed to be mortal because what dies is the unholiness. So let's take a look at life coming and life going. The beginning of life and the end of life. In the beginning of life, King David says in Tehillim, my mother and father abandoned me, but God gathered me in. My mother and father abandoned me. Is not, Lashon Hara, he's not bad-mouthing his parents and uh, speaking, uh, revealing secrets from home. He's describing every soul ever born. Parents, in a poetic sense, parents abandon their children at the very first moment of conception. Because conception takes place about, what, an hour or two after intimacy? So after the intimacy, parents usually are not paying attention to the conception that is taking place. It's out of their control. So they're sleeping usually. Mother and father are sleeping when the baby takes its first awesome step from heaven to earth. The first contact of the soul with a bodily substance, it's not even a body yet, it's the substance that will become a body at the very moment of conception. King David says, the soul remembers. Holy people consciously remember. But every soul is holy, and therefore it has no forgetfulness. It remembers everything. So King David says, I remember being conceived. And I looked around, who's babysitting? Who's in charge? Who's making sure everything goes well? It's a complicated business. You know, the nose gotta be right in the middle of the face, otherwise not good. So, so King David says, 
I looked around and my mother and father had abandoned me. They were fast asleep. But I was reassured by the presence of God who was gathering me in. So the first contact that a soul has, human soul, has with God is at the moment of conception. It is keenly aware that it cannot conceive itself, it cannot develop itself, it can't do anything itself, and there's nobody that can help. Not even the parents who are creating this baby. So only God is there to uh, move things along and make everything happen right. That is the first stage of human existence. After 40 days, there's a giant step, uh, another phase in the life of the individual. At 40 days, there is a body, there is something there. It's, it's solid now. Still has details to take care of, but it is, it is now a body. The soul feels embodied. At this three month stage, that's another phase. The connection between body and soul is becoming, is becoming stronger is becoming more thorough. They're not strangers anymore. At five months, and then at nine months, further development, further stages. During this time, the godly soul is studying Torah. That's what the soul does in heaven. That's what the soul does in this heavenly place called the womb. In those nine months, it, study, it studies the entire Torah. Now, birth. King David says, even when I go in the valley of the shadow of death, I am not afraid because you are with me. This is the second time that the soul experiences God's presence. It's not as traumatic it's not as miraculous as conception, but birth also is a frightening, overwhelming experience for the baby, for the fetus. And again, the fetus is looking for help. Who's taking care? This is the valley of the shadow of death. Going from the womb to the, out to the world, that's the valley, the birth canal. It's a valley between two mountains. The life in the womb is a wonderful life. Life outside the womb is strange and exciting. But in between, there is a valley and it's, it's, it's scary. There is a shadow of death. So again, the soul looks around. Who's in charge? What's going on? How do I survive this trauma? And King David says, once again, God was there. And so the fear did not overwhelm me, even though it erased my memory of nine wonderful months. So it is quite traumatic. And we really should pay attention medically, just off the record. Um, every child goes through a terrible trauma being born. Physical trauma, certainly emotional trauma. So it should be treated. Something should be done to, uh, to calm the baby and to ease that transition. So now the baby is born and it's hold on its new life, breathing on its own, is a little tenuous. For 30 days, we don't know whether this child is viable. So after 30 days, that's another phase 
of connectedness between body and soul. So at birth, the body and soul are completely connected. The question is, how strongly is it permanent in terms of a lifespan? So at the end of 30 days, it is permanent. Now the soul begins to take on a life, to function as a body and soul combo. So life comes to the body, comes into the world in stages. Even then it's traumatic. Imagine if it all happened in one moment. One moment you're not, the next moment you are breathing and thinking and cold because you need a blanket. That would be way, way too traumatic and we wouldn't survive. Now at the end of life, oh, by the way, the godly soul then takes another 12 years to settle into a young girl and 13 years to settle into a young boy. This comedian says, Jewish comedian, of course, he says, Nicole Kidman, in her last name, I detect a tiny little bar mitzvah. <laughs> kid man. Before your bar mitzvah, you're a kid. That today you are a man. So the godly soul takes a longer time to merge with the body because they're so different. The human soul is not that different because it's also a creation. So you might say that the human soul is a spiritual creation, the human body is a physical creation, and bringing them together is something of a miracle. We actually make a blessing, thanking God for this constant miracle of merging body and soul when they are so inherently and essentially different. But they're both creations. The godly soul is of a completely different, of a completely different cut. And therefore it takes longer for the godly soul to um, completely permeate, settle into the body. Now, at the end of life, the process is reversed. It doesn't happen all at once. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a series of steps and phases, increments, as the body and soul separate. They've become quite attached to each other. Because even the godly soul is affected if the body is not healthy. If the body is in pain, the godly soul can't do its job. And so they become very devoted to each other. The body suffers if the soul is unhappy, psychosomatic, and the soul suffers when the body is not healthy. So they've become quite a, quite a pair. Separating now becomes very painful. It was traumatic to come together. Now it's painful to, to part. So the first thing that happens for most people is that they suddenly become aware, sometimes quite consciously, sometimes barely consciously, but there are signs that they are aware. People who live short lives live so well. They accomplish so much. They are so alive as long as they're alive as if they sensed that they don't have much time and they got to get it all in. And so they accomplish a lot in a short time relative to other people. But when, when the time comes, most people have a, a sixth sense that it's time to uh, wrap things up. 
it doesn't it doesn't help to argue with them they don't give up on life that would be wrong because every minute of life is an eternity so even if you have only a few minutes left you don't give up those minutes ever but you know that the time is short that allows us to get our affairs in order, not just human affairs, but also our relationship with God. Rambam says, a person who sinned all his life, and at the end of life, the last moment before the, the soul leaves the body, the person sincerely regrets and might even say, if I could live my life over again, I would, I would be better. I would do more good. I would serve God more sincerely, more consistently. The person who says that and feels that is actually doing a genuine tshuva. He is clearing away all of the mistakes that he now regrets and they are erased and they are forgiven and his soul comes to heaven pure. So now, after that phase of anticipation, well, premonition I think is a better word, now comes the moment, the moment of death. The moment of death means that there is a a, a gap between the body and the soul. They're no longer merged. They're no longer um, united as a unit. Now there's a body and there's a soul. The soul looks at the body and says, I really don't want to leave. But, but there are two entities now. They're not one anymore. The body lo lost its energy and its life, but the soul has not lost interest in the body. So there is a distance that develops between them, but the soul is not gone from the body, meaning it's not lost its interest, it's not lost its connection. There's a relationship, but they're not one. It's like being engaged, but not married. So the, so the soul, in a manner of speaking, hovers around the body, reluctant to leave. You might call that an out-of-body experience. Out of body, but not lost, uh, not, not in a separate universe, just out of body, but present next to the body, in the vicinity of the body, because it, it, still, it still is attached emotionally. That is a seven-day process, which we call Shiva, and that is the amount of time that we sit mourning the loss of that, of that connection. So what we're actually doing when we sit and mourn is that we are empathizing, we are sharing the soul's sadness and pain. It's very intense in the first three days of the seven. And so we mourn intensely in those three days. The next four days are slightly less painful. And so the mourning also lightens up a little bit. 
in some traditions, you don't visit a bereaved person in the first three days. The soul's trauma is too intense for, for even consoling visitors. In the last four days, visitors are welcome. Sharing the grief is now possible. In the first three days, it's too, too painful to even share. Today, and particularly in the Chabad community, we visit in the first three days as well. But there is a difference, right? Then there's a 30-day period. The soul is getting comfortable in its new location. It's going back to being a soul without a body as it always was, the godly soul. And the part of the human soul that has now become eternal. By the end of 30 days, the soul is pretty much uh, certainly uh, accepted its new condition, but it's also getting adjusted and comfortable. And that takes up to a year to make that transition complete. Up to a year. For some people, it is very short. The soul remained innocent and pure throughout its life. Going back to being a soul in heaven is, is you know, like riding a bicycle. You never forget. So some souls come back to heaven and it's as if they never left. They pick up where they had left off and they're back to being a soul in heaven and they are a soul like all other souls. They feel comfortable, they feel at, at rest. That's what we mean by rest. May he rest in peace. There's no real rest. The soul is not inert. It's living, it's breathing, it's, li it's, it's moving, it's alive, and it's experiencing all sorts of intense emotions and newfound wisdom. So it's certainly not just sitting there at peace, but what we mean by rest and peace is enjoy being a soul. Sometimes the soul has a hard time. It can't let go of its earthy pleasure. It thinks in terms of earth. It thinks in terms of body. It kind of smells like earth, like a body, but it's in heaven. And that smell is not welcome. It's out of place. And so the soul is embarrassed. That embarrassment is what we call burning like burning with shame. That burning is what we call hell. It's hell to come back to heaven and not look and feel and smell like a soul. But that wears off. For some people, it wears off almost immediately. They never get to be embarrassed. For some people, the embarrassment lingers. Up to a month, up to a year. When we say Kaddish, we are helping the soul make that adjustment, shedding the memories of the pleasures of the physical, of the mundane, and rediscovering the pleasures of being a soul. So, where is heaven and where is hell? They are not location. We're, we're accustomed to speaking of heaven as up and hell as down. You go down to hell, you go up to heaven. It's not a spatial uh, concept. Heaven and earth for the soul are simply different pleasures. The pleasure of earth, familiar to the body, shared by the soul, is an earthy pleasure. The pleasure of, of a soul without a body is a heavenly pleasure. 
a soulful pleasure. So what the, the relocation is from the pleasures of earth to the pleasures of heaven. That doesn't take up space. It's not up or down. It's simply a different experience. So when we say the soul went to heaven, we mean the soul switched to enjoying heavenly pleasures instead of the physical pleasures that it had while connected to the body. So if you say, where is the soul? And some people say, oh, they're in a better place now. It's not a better place. There is no better place than Earth. Earth has its problems. Not everything is beautiful yet on Earth. But Earth is the place to be, the best place to be. So dying does not take you to a better place. It takes you to a more spiritual place, to a more heavenly place, to a place without pain and without fear and without um, ugliness. So it's a nicer place, not a better place. So when they ask, so where is, so where is the soul now? Where did it go? We, we think in terms of physical location, of geography, did it go upstairs, downstairs? Where did it go? It went from earthiness to heavenliness. That doesn't have a particular limited place. The soul in heaven can still be earthy. It's a little embarrassing, but it can. <clears throat> and a soul on earth in a body can still be heavenly. There are such people. So the soul leaves the body in stages. First, there's the premonition. Then there's the moment of separation. Then there are the seven days when the soul painfully and, and tragically has to disconnect from the body. Then there's the 30 day period where it's getting comfortable being a soul in heaven. And then there are the 12 months that some souls are going to need before they're completely wrapped up in the life of a soul. Now, is that the end? Still not the end. The soul really enjoyed being on a mission. While it's in a body, rather than in heaven, which is his natural habitat, it senses a sense of purpose. Because why would a soul be on earth? Only for a purpose, a mission. And being on a mission, being able to serve God's purpose, being able to do for him what he needs is such a privilege and it's such a powerful experience for the soul that even after it leaves the body, it kind of yearns to be serving God on earth rather than being rewarded by God in heaven. So heaven, the pleasures that the soul has when it, when it is free of the body, is the reward for the soul's good behavior. But the soul would rather be still at the, at the job serving God rather than being rewarded. And that's why the sages tell us, don't do mitzvahs for the sake of the reward not only because it's more noble, but because you're going to regret not being able to serve while you're receiving the reward. Because the soul by its very nature would rather serve than be served. There's where true altruism exists. 
The soul has no, the godly soul has no agenda. It doesn't need anything for itself. It doesn't need life. Being on earth, being in a body, being alive in the human sense is a mission, a divine mission. And the pleasure of serving is greater than the pleasure of being served. So when we do a mitzvah, there's nothing in it for us. We can find benefits. It's a beautiful lifestyle. It's a meaningful lifestyle. It's a wise lifestyle. But we don't need that. We, didn't, we weren't born in order to have a little wisdom and, and a little beauty. There's got to be a much bigger purpose. So it's serving rather than being served that excites the soul. So it yearns to be back in a body. When the children continue the goodness that the parents believed in, that the parents taught the children, wished for them and so on, when the children are still doing good and serving God, that gives the soul a greater pleasure than the pleasures that are natural to heaven. Knowing that the children are still making earth a godlier place gives the soul great pleasure because the soul would love to be doing that itself. So that's why on the Yisker memorial prayer, when we say Yisker for a departed parent or grandparent or sibling, we, we, we offer, without, without promising, we offer to give charity on their behalf. Because the one mitzvah that the soul in heaven misses the most is charity. In heaven, there's no charity. Nobody needs you. Everybody's got their own reward and enjoying their own pleasures. But in, uh, on earth, God created this imbalance where one person needs another and the poor man needs help from the wealthy man and the wealthy man needs the poor man to give him the opportunity to serve God. So we offer to give charity on behalf of those souls so that they, they feel like they're still influencing life on earth. That also is a great pleasure for the soul. Now, eventually, and we don't often speak about this because this is a whole nother, a whole nother realm of, of reality. Eventually, every body, the physical body that hosted a, a soul and together they served God, the body has not received its reward. So if the soul goes to heaven and is rewarded for the mitzvahs that it performed, what about the body? Can't do a mitzvah without a body. So justice demands that somewhere, sooner or later, the body has to get its reward. Going back to the earth is not its reward. That's its nature. That's why we have to believe that after Mashiach comes and when the world becomes a perfectly moral, godly place, the souls will leave heaven and come back to earth. How will they come back to earth? They will re-enter the body that they had with which they performed the mitzvah in which they served God together. 
That's known as the resurrection. The dead bones, the dry bones will rise again. The body will come back together just like it can decompose, it can also recompose. Well, not it can, but God can make it recompose after it had decomposed. It will come back together exactly as it was while it served God. The soul that it had will come back to it and together they will be given the true reward. The reward in heaven is only partial and therefore temporary. This means that for all the years that the soul was in heaven, like for example, Avraham and Sarah, all those years, 4,000 years, they're waiting to come back into their bodies, which means the soul never completely gives up on its body. There's something awesome about what's happening in the world today. People who die today in the Jewish community, um, their children cannot say Kaddish for them because of the quarantine. They did not say Yisker for them this past holiday. What's awesome about it is that God is telling us by arranging this circumstance in which you cannot go to the synagogue, you cannot go to shul, you cannot have a minion, and therefore you cannot say Kaddish or Yisker, God is telling us the people who died this year don't need it. They don't need your prayers. They don't need your, your mourning for them. They're doing fine. Now, of course, this doesn't take, a, take away our personal pain, our, our loss, our grief. But it is comforting to know that the soul is doing fine. It will not take 12 months. There is no painful readjustment. There is something unusual happening and God is letting us know very clearly, you're not going to go to shul, you're not going to go to the synagogue, you're not going to say Kaddish, you're not even going to sit seven days of Shiva. Why? The soul doesn't need it. And if the soul doesn't need it, what's left is only your loss. Your loss can't be dictated. Mourn for seven days, three days, intensely, four days, less. You can't dictate how you mourn. That's for the benefit of the soul, of the departed soul. But personal grief, you, you work it out depending on your personality and the role of the person who, who passed away, how, how strongly they affected you, the bond and so on. So that, of course, is real. But there's also this unprecedented, I think. Souls coming back to heaven and they don't need the Kaddish. Pretty awesome thought. We also have to be aware that the resurrection that brings back every godly soul and every elevated human soul that has attained immortality. So every righteous person will be resurrected and every godly soul will come back <clears throat> into its body. So death, it turns out, is temporary. Life is permanent. Yeah. Yeah. We are so convinced that death is permanent and life is temporary that we've really cheated ourselves out of some enthusiasm for life. 
if we know for sure that life is forever, we live better, we live more fully. Being convinced that life is temporary, it drains some of the enthusiasm out of life and gives death too much significance. You know, it's we're all we're all gonna end up there. That's where everybody goes. Death is unavoidable. That's a terrible attitude. Death will happen when it's supposed to happen. Until that moment, we don't care. We're not interested in death. We're interested in life. And we shouldn't be afraid of death. We should be afraid of life. A day of life is awesome. You know, remember the expression, a mind is a terrible thing to waste? You can't waste a mind, but you can waste a day. And a day is a terrible thing to waste. You don't waste a mind. You destroy it. If you don't use it properly, you're killing it. Your brain cells are dying. But the amazing effect that being quarantined has had on so many people. You know what the, the biggest blessing is? Of course, you get to stay home with your family if you have a family. You get to know your children if you have children. You get to know your spouse. You thought you did, but you don't. Until you're quarantined together, you don't really know each other. But even beyond that, you get to know yourself. Effortlessly. It's not soul searching. Soul searching is usually misleading. People who go on soul searches end up developing concepts and, and, and impressions about themselves that are so far from the truth. They either exaggerate their faults way beyond out of all proportion, or they exaggerate their importance and their and their talents and their preciousness way out of proportion. Soul searching can be very tricky, but being alone with yourself, you can't avoid it. You're staring yourself in the face and you get to know yourself. It's a very maturing, sobering experience. You see things about yourself that are horrifying. I thought I, I outgrew that a long time ago. Obviously, I haven't. I thought I was good at this. I'm obviously not. And then you see the good stuff. How did I get to be a head of a family? How did I get to be the mother of these incredible kids? Why did God entrust me with such an important mission? You get to see yourself in a very different and more realistic light. So, Death is temporary. Life is permanent. And life does not happen at work. Life does not happen in the streets. Life does not happen in the park. Life does not happen on an airplane. Life happens at home. We're learning that quite graphically too. This is where we live. The rest is commentary to borrow an expression from Hillel. So that is the story of life and death. Death will eventually be discontinued. It serves a purpose. It is necessary in the perfecting process of the universe. But once the world is perfected, it will no longer be necessary. It is certainly not welcome. It is not uh, admired or appreciated. It's only necessary. And when it stops being necessary, it will disappear. 
it's temporary. Not only will people stop dying, but those who have died will be coming back. It's a little difficult to imagine. Although we have seen films run backwards in reverse. You see the bricks of the building coming back together, each one in their right place. That's called recomposing instead of decomposing. So it's not like it's impossible physically. Um, there are no laws of nature that say it shouldn't or couldn't happen. So it will happen. And the sooner the better, because we really have invested a lot of goodness into this little planet. A lot of intense good feelings, moral feelings, godly feelings. So it still needs a little improvement, but can't be that much longer. The world after, after the, uh, this thing that we're all frightened by, when that's over, the world is going to be an even better place than it was before. Speaking to a journalist, he's on medication. Because all the bad news that he has been reporting and covering is just so depressing that he, ha he had to take some antidepressants. But all of that is going to end. And from now on, all journalism will report happy, inspiring stories of goodness, stories of her heroic behavior, of beautiful things that human beings do, even in difficult times. That's going to become the news. We don't want to hear about pain. We don't want to hear about bad guys. We want to hear about godliness. And that is the fulfillment of the prophecy that says, days are coming when there will be a great hunger and a great thirst, not a hunger for bread and not a thirst for water, but a thirst to get to know God. This is the time. If you want to describe the 21st century, this is what we're talking about. We have bread and we have water. We're not hungry for that. We have any pleasure we want and we have it endlessly, infinitely, without any restrictions. And we don't want it. It's not doing it for us. We want to get to know our purpose and our mission, which means we want to hear God's instruction. We want to know what he needs from us because we would rather be needed than be needy. That is the story of life and death.